So we are live right now. Uh, we'll begin shortly from now. Okay, I'll I'll follow your cue. I'm ready to go. Sure. Should we go ahead and get started? Or um, yes, for sure. I suppose we could do that. Okay, just a moment. Welcome to lecture series, Techniche 2021, the annual techno management festival organized by Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Through lecture series, our goal has always been to facilitate interaction with remarkable innovators of various fields. Managing to do a single task perfectly often costs a good deal of hard work. Pioneering in a certain field can very well take an entire lifetime. So what could possibly be the limit to the number of fields that a single person can excel in? Well, today, we have with us Dr. Scott Parazinski, a man who stands as a testimony to the fact that there is absolutely no such limit. He's a veteran NASA astronaut who has accomplished five space flights, logging over a thousand hours in space, which is the equivalent of eight weeks. He's also an established mountaineer who has summited countless peaks on the face of this planet, including Mount Everest. His book, The Sky Below, describes his experience as the first person to go to space as well as summit the highest peak. Apart from this, he's also a licensed pilot with over 2,500 hours of flight time, the founder and CEO of an innovative tech startup, Fluidity Technologies, and also a qualified physician specializing in molecular biology and space physiology. Many of his hobbies are an entire career in themselves. Sir, on behalf of Techniche, I would like to very warmly welcome you to this event. It is an absolute honor to have you here. We would like to remind our audience that we have a Discord server where you can watch and discuss this lecture with your friends. The link will be posted in the chat box shortly. We will also be having a QA and a session at the end of this keynote. So please feel free to drop any questions in the chat box. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. It is a great honor to be with you here today. I, I wish we could all be together in person. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic is has prevented that from, from being possible, but perhaps at some point in the future, I can uh, come visit your beautiful part of India. Uh, my wife is a Punjabi, actually. She went to Punjab University and she's a world-renowned planetary scientist, uh, uh, Dr. Manakshi Wadwa. Um, so she would be a, a maybe an interesting speaker for you in the future, but uh, it is my great honor to, uh, to share with you some hopefully interesting stories, uh, some beautiful imagery and, uh, and uh, perhaps some inspiration uh, for, for things that uh, uh, you might uh, find uh, useful in, in your career. Lessons that I've taken over the, the course of my, my 60 years uh, of exploration. I'm fundamentally an explorer at heart, um, not just an astronaut, but someone who really enjoys going to challenging places because I find that they're incredible catalysts for innovation. And I'll explain more what I mean by that through examples in the course of my talk. But what I find is that when we send people to space, when we go to the tallest mountains deep beneath our oceans or into other extreme places uh, uh, in and around our planet, we have to invent new technologies to make it safe 
for explorers to go there for us to extract uh, the science that we we aspire to do, um, to uh, um, essentially uh, make it possible for um, for innovation and uh, those those types of uh, technologies then find their way into our everyday lives. And so when I go into an intensive care unit or an operating room here on earth, I see so many different examples of technologies that were first invented uh, for the space program or to keep people warm on the, co the coldest uh, mountains and in Antarctica. Uh, so there are so many different examples of, of uh, how challenging ourselves uh, physically and uh, in exploration benefits uh, society as a whole. So uh, I welcome you to follow me on uh, social media. I'm known as Astro Doc Scott. Uh, and uh, let's get a, get going here with my talk. Um, here we go. So uh, as a young boy, I grew up watching the Apollo program. And of course, this is the uh, the NASA program that first sent astronauts to the moon in the late 60s and early 70s. And I was only seven years old when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin here uh, set first, first boot prints on the moon. And I want to be the very first to uh, set boot prints on Mars. Uh, I wanted to, to rappel down into the Valles Marinaris, which is dwarfs our Grand Canyon, and climb Olympus Mons, which is five times taller than our own Mount Everest. It didn't quite work out that way for me, but uh, maybe it'll work out for some of you. And in fact, there are, there are several uh, astronauts of, of Indian descent uh, already. Uh, my good friend, Kulpna Chawla, who you, you may have heard of, sadly passed uh, on the Columbia uh, Space Shuttle several years ago. Uh, but Sonny Williams uh, and uh, Shrisha uh, Banja and, and others to follow and uh, perhaps one day you'll get a chance to, to fly in space or even set set foot on the on the Mars uh, surface. So my life has uh, been rather uh, um, extreme, I guess, and, and a lot of fun. Not only have I done uh, several spacewalks, as I'll relate here in a moment, but I've been to the top of the world. Uh, the upper left here is the top of Mount Everest. Uh, I've been inside an active volcano called Messiah in Nicaragua. I've been to the South Pole and deep beneath our oceans. And not only in the, in the spirit of adventure, uh, but in the spirit of exploration and to, to use these environments as uh, a catalyst for my own innovation. And I'll talk about some of that here in a moment. But what I'd like to share with you is that what I think our common DNA, all of us here uh, are uh, engineers, scientists, innovators. What really gets me excited is uh, um, the opportunity an obligation actually to innovate. So I'm a physician by training. So I see myself in a position where um, I must innovate, um, but you as well, you know, you're, you have the, the gift of uh, you know, brilliant minds and, and uh, the tools of engineering and science. You're at one of the finest institutions in all of India. You know, you, you need to continue to ask yourself, how are there uh, ways in which uh, I can make this situation better to be very aware of what's around you uh, to identify the, uh, uh, the uh, inconsistencies, the problems, the uh, inconveniences uh, of the environment that you're working in, what's, uh, what's not uh, cost effective, what's um, uh, an opportunity for improvement. And once you've identified that, that's the hardest part of invention. After you've identified a problem in need of a fix, then you can apply basic engineering principles and uh, generally come up with a full solution. So as a serial inventor myself, uh, that's that's how I've found uh, a, a great value. Um, just being very, very uh, observant as to, to what's working, what's not, what's inducing pain for our patients, uh, where are there opportunities to make things uh, more efficient um, and provide better outcomes. It's also, um, I, I've been gifted with this incredible perspective of seeing our planet from this God's eye view. Uh, this is a little bit further out from planet Earth than I've been. This is actually from a satellite um, that's beyond our, our moon. And that's actually the, the far side of the moon that's coming in front of the, the camera lens. But seeing our beautiful planet from space really changes you. And I, I hope some of you will get this uh, orbital perspective in the future. 
seeing your planet without boundaries, without dots on the map that depict cities, but just a confluence of nature and, and uh, humanity. And you, you realize how fragile it is and how we must do everything we can to uh, protect it. It's a, it's a very fragile ecosystem. And we have a lot of work to do. It's also a very exciting time to be alive. I hope you agree with me in that, uh, but there's so many different uh, companies and, and technologies coming to bear um, in many different industries, but certainly in the space industry in particular, uh, companies like Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, uh, and of course, SpaceX that's uh, doing remarkable things almost every week now. Um, and uh, of course, NASA's goal ultimately to return astronauts to the moon and actually to go to Mars. This is going to happen in your lifetimes and perhaps you can have a role in it as well. But certainly my uh, uh, idol here in this uh, uh, industry is Elon Musk. And I'm sure you've heard the name. He's the founder of uh, PayPal, Tesla, and of course, SpaceX. And he re repeatedly has flown car well as astronauts up to the International Space Station. But he actually has an ambition to send hundreds of people to colonize Mars in the not too distant future. And in fact, he's building these enormous rockets here on the left with 42 engines on the tail of it to take 100 people at a time to go uh, live and create a society uh, on Mars. And in fact, he's so dedicated to this vision that he actually wants to die on Mars. That's his stated goal, which I think is uh, you know, quite a commitment, quite a statement. But uh, it's really quite extraordinary that uh, a private citizen, granted he's a, a billionaire, uh, but still a private citizen can have these big goals and, uh, and work to make them come true. It's not just uh, large government organizations that are able to take on uh, goals like this, but individuals like, um, like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and others. So how do we go about going into these types of environments? Well, it, it, it's not something that you can um, take on without proper training, without an understanding of the risk. So you need to understand the perils that you're, you're facing and then have an idea of what you would do if something were to go wrong. So it, we call this risk management. It's an essential whether you're flying you know, a complex uh, fighter aircraft. This, the, these are the T-38 jets that we would fly uh, around the country in our training. But then when you get into a cockpit like this, this is the, the forward flight deck of the space shuttle that I flew on on five occasions. There are over 3,000 different switches, circuit breakers, displays, and controls to operate this. And you needed to know not just how things were supposed to work, but what happens if, if they fail. Uh, so we would spend hundreds of hours in the simulator practicing what would happen if we lost a data string here, an auxiliary power unit over there, and a communication link uh, over here. How do we understand the implications of all these failures and what do we do next? Um, and so it's, it requires a deep, deep understanding of not just how things are supposed to work, but how they might fail and to have in your mind a plan for what you might do if something uh, were to were to fail along the pathway. So thinking ahead is really the the way in which you can uh, take on a greater and greater risk. And so we would spend uh, all this time in a simulator prior to flight, and uh, they would throw all sorts of different malfunctions at us in these simulations. And by the time we were ready to go, it was sort of like a graduate school examination we were ready to handle anything. And so when a master alarm with the flashing lights and alarms would go off, uh, our heart would barely skip a beat and we would immediately know the right thing to do and, and deal with the situation. So it, like I said, it, it comes with a lot of, uh, of preparation and forethought. As engineers and scientists, I, I think this is something that we probably also share, but a sense of relentless curiosity so essential uh, for success in the future, I think. Um, and as I described it, thinking, you know, how can I make things better? How can I contribute? What is my unique contribution that I can make? So I wanted to take you on a short expedition to South America. This is uh, behind 
This group here is the summit of La Concabur volcano. And it's on the border of Bolivia and Chile. It's a very big place in the Atacama Desert. And I'm with a group of astrobiologists. These are scientists who study life in the extreme. And what they hope to do is understand life in this very austere location up at the top of this mountain uh, where there's very little oxygen, where there's high ultraviolet radiation, where there's lots of solar illumination, a very inhospitable place, very much like what Mars must have been like about three and a half billion years ago. These are scientists that want to characterize life in this environment because if they understand it there, when we go to Mars, we'll be able to uh, identify and, and really study and understand uh, how life might have evolved in that very similar environment. So I was invited to this expedition. They, this group had been to the top of the mountain the year before uh, one time. And, uh, and so they, they wanted to extend an invitation to an astronaut because the thought was in the future, we would use environments like this as a training ground for planetary scientists who would go to Mars or back to the moon. And so as a physician astronaut and also as a mountaineer, I was there in a support role, but also to evaluate the, the whole environment. And I wanted to contribute as a, a team member. And, uh, and so they were briefing me on this expedition. They said that they had gone up to this summit Caldera Lake. And one of the things that they wanted to do is go back to the top of the mountain um, as they had done the year before. And they wanted to measure whether or not the lake was receding or growing uh, with time. And, uh, and so the year before they had put this uh, boat in the water. This is at nearly um, 6,000 uh, meters above sea level. So very, very high altitude, very, very cold, just above freeze, freezing temperatures. They had to drop a diver in the water and just with the string measurement, uh, make a few very crude measurements. And so I wanted to contribute. I was a, a new team member. So I asked for a small budget and I came up with the novel solution. Um, and what I did is I went out and I bought a boat. <laughs> and this was a battery operated uh, remote controlled boat. And I put a GPS receiver and a fish finder on this. And a, on the front of it, I had a little a sounding device and I drove a toy boat back and forth across this lake several times. And we're able to create a very accurate bathymetric map of, of this lake. The point I wanted to make is that it's very important as you go about yours to, to think about your team composition. If you build teams of people just like yourself who come from the same backgrounds, who probably think very much like you, you're not likely to get uh, the, the, uh, all of the creative ideas on the table that you might have otherwise. So it's very important to create what I call multidisciplinary teams, to bring on people who uh, uh, come from different walks of life and different backgrounds. And sometimes you come up with really wonderful solutions to problems. So I wanted to take you to space, of course, as well. So let's do that now. I had uh, the opportunity to fly in space on five occasions. Uh, with very international crews, um, crews from all over the world, from, uh, from Russia, from Japan, Canada, uh, uh, Italy, and France. Uh, but of course, space exploration involves the entire planet now, and it's, it's very exciting to think of the future. But let's, uh, let's go, to, go to space now. Um, my first mission was back in 1994 aboard the space shuttle Atlantis. And we studied the ozone layer, which you may be aware is our Earth's sunglasses, essentially the protective layer that uh, uh, prevents us from all getting skin cancers, uh, protects our plant uh, growth and our, our plankton blooms in our ocean. If we didn't have this protective layer, life on, on our planet would likely be uh, unrecognizable. So we studied uh, the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere for 11 days with very sensitive instruments, including this satellite that we deployed on the left-hand side here called Christus Faz. Very, very exciting first mission for me. And so when I came back to uh, Earth, the first thing I wanted to do is get back in line and fly again. Unfortunately, uh, it turned out that uh, I was too tall to safely use the Soyuz uh, capsule in an emergency. 
Uh, and so I was told after about five months of training, including intensive Russian language training, that I was too tall and I would have to uh, go back to Houston. So what they decided to do then is assign the woman here on the right, her name is Wendy Lawrence, to replace me. Uh, turns out that she was too short to uh, do spacewalks aboard the Russian space station, and they needed to do some emergency spacewalks up there. So I became known as Too Tall Perizinski, and she became Too Short Lawrence. And uh, we were quite disappointed in this, but uh, our friend in the middle here, Dave Wolf, uh, we called him Too Average, but he ended up uh, replacing us both on this long duration mission, but we ended up all flying together aboard the space shuttle and docking to the Russian space station. And uh, it was really a, an exciting mission because we had to do uh, some spacewalks. I, I led the first joint US-Russian spacewalk with the Russian colleague, Vladimir Titov. I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but this solar panel here had been damaged uh, by the resupply ship. And uh, um, so we went out on a spacewalk to retrieve some experiments that had been set outside on the space station and then also to leave some tools outside to try and fix this. Unfortunately, it wasn't ultimately possible to, to save the Mir space station. And it's now in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. I'm sorry, in the, in the South Pacific Ocean. And here's a, my, myself out on a spacewalk testing a jet backpack, which is really quite, quite fun. I'm not sure if any of you have read the book, The Right Stuff, or seen the movie, but um, it was about our early space program and the Mercury astronauts in particular. And we started to hear rumors when I came back from this flight that one of our most famous astronauts, John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth, would be returning the space flight at age 77. And uh, I think that I would be a candidate for this flight, but they needed a physician astronaut to take care of Senator Glenn. He was 77 years old when we, when we flew together on this mission. And it was the honor of my lifetime to, to be there in space with, uh, with my boyhood hero. He was uh, a lot of fun, uh, but we had to draw lots and lots of his blood uh, for different experiments. So we, we, he ended up uh, teasing me and calling me Dracula, um, essentially a vampire because of all the blood that I was uh, uh, removing from his veins. But he was a, a great sport through all of this. And then uh, I had an opportunity to fly to the early International Space Station and help install the Canada arm to the uh, outside of the space station, doing two spacewalks with a colleague from Canada, Chris Hatfield. And it's really an amazing experience to be outside on a spacewalk um, in your own personal spaceship. Everything that you need to sustain life has to be engineered around the astronaut. Um, you need oxygen delivery, carbon dioxide removal, little power, uh, radio communication, of course, lights, cameras, a jet backpack, power tools. It really is your own personal spaceship. And uh, to have a thin visor between you and the enormity of the universe is just unbelievable. One of the, the greatest memories of my life. And so here we are uh, uh, up aboard the, the space station. And uh, as the, the space station looked as we separated. The most difficult uh, chapter of my professional career was uh, the loss of this amazing crew. This is the STS-107 Columbia crew, um, commanded my, by my very good friend, Rick Husband here in the front. And some of you may recognize the wonderful lady on the far left, that's Kulp Nachala. Uh, obviously uh, born in India, she became an American citizen and ultimately a NASA astronaut. And I was one of the family escorts for this crew when they launched into space and I supported their families during the mission. And we expected to greet them home after their flawless 16 day mission. Unfortunately, a piece of foam came off of the orange external tank that uh, took them to orbit and damaged the left wing of their space shuttle, caused a breach in that. And as they re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, uh, the uh, the ship disintegrated and we lost these wonderful, wonderful people. And so I had a very difficult decision. You know, what do I do? Uh, do I hang up my spacesuit at this point or uh, 
do we continue on in their honor and figure out what had gone wrong and then make sure that it would never happen again. And of course that is, you know, what we did and that's the NASA way. Um, and uh, after two and a half years of very, very hard work in laboratories and in simulations like these, I was the, the lead astronaut for uh, doing spacewalking to repair the space shuttle if it were damaged in the future, we were able to return to flight. And I took one last flight aboard uh, the Space Shuttle Discovery, and it was really my most epic mission. So I look forward to sharing some exciting stories from this flight. It was commanded by a female astronaut, uh, Pam Melroy, who's now the deputy administrator of NASA, a great pilot and a great friend and, and person, um, and a wonderful crew. Um, and so let's look at what it, it's like to actually leave the planet. About six seconds before the launch, the water deluge system starts, and then it, uh, then the throttles, uh, engines throttle up. And if computers on board sense that they're working properly, at T zero, those white solid rocket motors will ignite, and you lift off the uh, the launch pad um, with this incredible sense of acceleration. You're going 160 kilometers an hour by the time you clear the launch tower. You can see that our heads bobbling here and the, we're feeling three times the, the force of gravity on our chest, squeezing us back into our seat. We roll on our backs and you can see the waves crashing on the beach and, and the clouds receding beneath you. It's, it's just this extraordinary sense of, of motion and acceleration and vibration, taking about eight and a half minutes to go from zero kilometers an hour on the launch pad to 25,000 kilometers an hour. And, uh, and here we are uh, about three days later, just underneath the International Space Station as we're about to rendezvous and dock with the space station. Uh, just a gorgeous view. You can see our Harmony interconnecting module in our payload bay here. If you're able to see my, my cursor and our robotic arm and an inspection boom here, this sort of looks like an aircraft, but very, very different as well because there are jet thrusters. There's a, a KU band antenna here. Uh, the orbit burn uh, motors back here. Uh, it's both uh, a launch vehicle as well as an orbital spacecraft. And finally, it's a glider when we come back home. And we'll talk about that later. Our destination here is the International Space Station. And one of the biggest objectives besides installing the Harmony interconnecting module is to relocate this T-shaped structure on the top of the space station. We're going to unbolt it out on spacewalks and then with the robotic arms, move it out to the very tip of the space station. And then if all goes well, unfurl these solar panels that are here in these blanket boxes here and here. And uh, then the space station will have additional power to support future European and Japanese modules. But spoiler alert, things don't go exactly as planned. And that's where things got very, very interesting and challenging. We're planning on doing five spacewalks on the, on the mission. And the, the first three spacewalks were the most demanding we thought. And here we are at the end of the third spacewalk and I'm just grinning from ear to ear because I'm the lead spacewalker. Everything on perfectly so far. We're about to float inside the airlock and, and celebrate. But uh, what we found out as we came inside, our whole crew was looking at this tiny little zoomed in view of the tip of the space station where the crew had just commanded those solar panels to unfurl and they became damaged. Uh, there's a small wire, a steel braid cable that had been hit by space debris, we, we later found out. And uh, this piece of uh, gummed up wire had actually begun to rip apart the solar plant panel in two places here and here. And so it was just partially deployed. It was in a very precarious uh, position. If we were to undock the space shuttle at this point, um, we might damage the space shuttle or the space station that could rip apart. Um, and so we either had to go out on a, an emergency spacewalk to throw away a billion dollar national asset or figure out a way to repair it. And one of the things that I love about NASA is its capacity to take these seemingly impossible situations and come up with brilliant solutions. And that's exactly what they did. This is... Uh, uh, Stephanie uh, Wilson, our, our flight engineer and lead robotics uh, officer, and then Dan Tani. Both of them had to fly a very difficult 
trajectory with me at the tip of this 30 meter long robotic boom. And then with me, I had these devices that George Zamka, our pilot, had built with the commander of the space station, uh, Peggy Whitson, uh, for me to repair the, the damage on this missile. And then uh, they were concerned that I would become electrocuted uh, from the, the solar panel. We couldn't turn it off um, being in close proximity to it. It's generating electricity even in the shadow of the earth. So we had to uh, put on special uh, non-conductive tape around the metal parts of my spacesuit so that I wouldn't uh, receive any electrical shock uh, from the solar panel. So uh, quite an exciting uh, spacewalk. And then I had a, a 45 minute ride out to the very tip of the space station. This is actually a view from my helmet mounted camera looking back at the space shuttle. And here I am down at the very tip of the, this robotic boom headed out here to the very tip of the space station further than we'd ever been from the safety of our airlock before. And uh, it's gold and shiny and very beautiful, but uh, you're quite, uh, quite dangerous to be around. So I had a special tool about this long called the hockey stick so I could keep the, the solar panel uh, from touching me. You can see it here in the foreground of my, my camera view. And I had to put in these couplings across the damage site um, and cut out that piece of guide wire that had ripped the solar panel apart. And miraculously, this, this procedure worked flawlessly and were able to install five of these repairs across the breadth of the, uh, the solar panel over the course of a seven hour, 19 minute spacewalk. So it was certainly the, the best day on the job ever uh, for me. And uh, I'm so proud of the NASA team for coming up with a, a brilliant solution like this. Um, and so we'll do a final inspection of, of the solar, solar panel and then command the solar panel to fully extend. And uh, as, uh, as we discovered, it generated 100% of the energy that it was designed for. And it allowed NASA then to launch those European and, and Japanese modules that I mentioned earlier. So one of the, the great successes of the uh, space shuttle space station era, sort of an Apollo 13 event, if you will. And uh, all of us who, who were part of this would tell you it was our, our very best day on the job ever. This is really fun. This is, uh, you could just pull yourself off with your fingertips and fly like Buzz Lightyear, you know, not touching anything for about uh, you know, 10 meters or something. Really a, a wonderful sense of, of freedom you know, being up there in space. Um, and so one of the, uh, the neat things that we do after we finish our mission, we do a full fly around of the International Space Station. And this is actually a photograph looking straight down on the Himalayas, which is a nice transition to the next uh, topic of my, uh, my talk here, which is my, my summit climb of Mount Everest. And one of the things that I did is I took the, the same kind of mental philosophy we use for space flight and applied it to going to the top of the world. It doesn't really count unless you make it a round trip. So as I like to say, you know, keep your eyes on the summit, but remember to make it a round trip. Uh, um, there are about 300 souls who are still on the mountain. They, um, they didn't make it all the way back down and I didn't wanna be one of those statistics. So I applied a lot of my risk management skills uh, and a lot of preparation to get ready for Everest. Uh, because I had been dreaming of this for years and years. This is a uh, quite a famous uh, photograph looking straight down on the top of Mount Everest. And this is a photograph uh, I took on my first shuttle mission, STS-66. Right in the center here is the top of the world. Uh, this is the Kangsheng face of Everest in China. Here is, this, is Nepal, actually. And the, uh, here's Everest Base Camp, the Kumbu Icefall, and the Western Coombe the south call, and then the route all the way up to the summit. So it, it's sort of like a topographic map that you can, you can study this. And it's, it's really a, a beautiful photograph uh, that I had above my desk for, for many years. And I would daydream, what would it be like to actually stand there with my own boot prints? And uh, so in 2008, I had my first opportunity to try. And uh, I wanted to learn from failures that had happened before. One book that I'd strongly recommend you, you check out is called Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. It's an amazing book, even if you have no interest in mountaineering, because it talks about 
um, ambition, leadership, uh, failure of leadership, um, just the um, all the the uh, uh, the best and worst of uh, um, people when they have high ambition. I, I guess I would say um, it was also a wonderful book to uh, use as a guidebook for what not to do on Mount Everest. And one of the things that I learned is that a lot of climbers will end up on the top of a mountain like Everest with frozen water ice in their backpack as opposed to water that they can drink. And one of the worst things you can do is uh, be dehydrated on the way down from Mount Everest. That's when most people hurt themselves or fall to their death. So I needed to have my faculties uh, on descent. And so what I did is I used it as a catalyst for my own innovation. And I invented a, a hydration system that would sit inside my down suit. And it had a closed feedback heater loop on a drink straw so that the, uh, the reservoir would always be active, um, accessible to me on the, uh, on the climb. So we're in the process of, of trying to commercialize this now. But uh, if you ever get an opportunity to travel to the Kumbu region of, of Nepal, it's not that far from you. It's a very beautiful place. Uh, I'm not sure I would recommend climbing up in the mountain, but if you did, uh, this is what it would look like. There are deep crevasses all around you. Some of them uh, perhaps uh, you know, 50 or 60 meters deep uh, that you have to cross using these ladders and big seracs that you have to climb. Uh, very, very steep. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful climb. Um, and around 7,000 meters, this is where we would start to use supplemental oxygen. I'm not sure if you can see the, the pain in my face at this point, but uh, or the bloodshot in my eyes, but I'm in excruciating pain. This is the 59th day of my expedition. And I have this horrible, horrible low back pain. I'm not sure what's going on, but I, I get up the following morning and I can't get comfortable to stretch. And uh, there's just no way to get uh, uh, any relief. And so I make the very difficult decision to descend the mountain even though the summit was only a day away, the summit of my dreams. But I, I knew I had to do the right thing. I, I couldn't jeopardize my own life. And moreover, I couldn't jeopardize the, the summit success of my teammates or maybe placing them in a life or death situation. So I, I left the mountain not knowing whether or not I'd ever be able to return. This is what I look like once I finally got back to Everest Base Camp. I'm still in excruciating pain and uh, I ultimately uh, flew out in a, a medical evacuation uh, helicopter, not uh, there for me, but to support my friend Monty here, who's uh, uh, very, very serious nosebleed. I had to stop at, uh, at camp two on my descent. Even though I was crippled, um, I got a call in the middle of the night as a physician to come tend to my friend Monty who had lost over 20% of his blood volume. It's very, very dry, thin air up at, um, at Camp 2, which is at about 5,000 meters uh, or 5,500 meters above sea level. And uh, so I was able to stop the bleeding and save his life. But uh, once we finally got him down to base camp, he needed uh, a medical evacuation. And I was very fortunate to also be able to get out uh, base camp on this helicopter with him. And ultimately, I needed surgery on my low back. I had ruptured a disc in my lumbar spine, my low back. And uh, thankfully, it was completely curative. And I was able to return to the mountain the following year and make my way up to the summit with my very good friend here. This is Danuru Sherpa from Fort Say. And uh, so it takes about uh, six to eight weeks to acclimatize to the thin air on the mountain. So this is at 8,000 meters, camp four, uh, where we are using supplemental oxygen from here all the way up to the top. And uh, it's a, really an extraordinary place. It's also the beginning of what's known as the death zone, uh, which is a dramatic name, but it's, it's quite true. It's a place where the human body really can't sustain itself. Uh, you, you can't get enough nutrients in your body. You can't drink enough. You can't uh, get enough oxygen up here. So you we just want to be here as short a period as possible, get to the summit and back down quickly as, as possible. So the, the day before summiting, we arrive here, we, we rest, we hydrate a little bit. And then in the middle of the night, we'll cross this plateau that you see here. 
get onto the right skyline and then work our way up to the summit. And if everything goes well, right around sunrise, we'll make it to the top of the world. And uh, this is what it looks like. This is around 4 a.m. Uh, local Nepal time. Uh, there's a beautiful golden Buddha on top of the planet. And then of course, uh, beautiful prayer flags all over the place uh, that are just you know, very, very uh, wonderful. Over, over time, of course, the, the sun, the, the snow, the ice, the wind, they slowly disintegrate and the prayers are carried upward. Um, it's a, a magical place. It's about 25 degrees centigrade below zero when we got there. You can hear the crunching snow. It's a wonderful place. Um, it's about the size of uh, perhaps a dining room table. Uh, very, very uh, small uh, summit and then with these very steep walls all around. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to do is pay tribute to some of my boyhood heroes. And so I took a sample from the top of, uh, uh, actually from uh, the moon. Oh, this is from the Sea of Tranquility uh, that Neil Armstrong had picked up on Apollo 11. And you can see Danuru framed this photograph beautifully. The, the moon is directly overhead. Um, but I took this beautiful sample to the top of uh, our planet and uh, I wanted to pay tribute to Sir Edmund Hillary and Neil Armstrong, who had both been boyhood heroes of mine. This is what uh, the descent off of the summit of Mount Everest looks like. This is the uh, the summit shadow cast uh, off to the west, and the descent uh, off of the summit ridge. If any of you uh, are are wondering, the Earth really is round. You can see it very clearly on top of Mount Everest. Just wanted to point that out. Um, and so what did we do with that uh, moon sample? Well, I mounted it actually on a small plaque here. You can see the, the four small lunar samples from Apollo 11. And here's a summit rock from the top of Mount Everest. This of course is Everest, this is uh, the moon. And this plaque was then up to the International Space Station where it now resides in a module called Tranquility. You can see it here. Uh, so it's there to inspire future generations of explorers. And finally, a couple of other expeditions that I'll take, take you on, give you ideas of um, other exciting things that are happening in our um, technologically advancing world. This is the, uh, the youngest lava lake in the world. It's called Masaya Volcano. It's in Nicaragua, just about 10 minutes away from the capital city of Managua. You may not be aware of this, but over 800 million people live in close proximity to volcanoes and are in peril potentially. And so we went on an expedition uh, to this location uh, sponsored by GE to implant a sensor array all around this volcano. And in fact, myself and Sam Kostman set the very first boot prints adjacent this lava lake to uh, uh, essentially collect an enormous data set that we'll be able to use by scientists using machine learning and, and uh, deep learning to uh, hopefully develop uh, models of predict, uh, eruptive activity. So if we if we can put our planet online, imagine if we could actually detect and uh, uh, alert people who lived in proximity to a, a volcano. It's time to time to evacuate, or a tsunami is coming, um, or a uh, or a, an earthquake is coming. The same sorts of tools are obviously being used in in healthcare to get way in advance of uh, uh, chronic disease. If we could predict um, a, a turn for the worse in cardiovascular fitness, uh, instead of treating a heart attack, can we get way in advance of, of those kinds of serious events and, um, and allow people not only to live longer, but to live a higher quality of life. So that's what really inspires me. Um, I'm also really excited about uh, telemedicine. Um, and so, you know, the space program, of course, has really been a catalyst for, for great innovation in telemedicine when we monitored the astronauts when they first uh, flew in space. But we also use these in Antarctica. And one of my jobs after I left NASA was as the chief medical officer for the Center for Polar Medical Operations, supporting the 3,000 or so scientists and engineers who go to Antarctica every year. And so we use telemedicine to uh, help them perform ultrasound uh, to deliver anesthesia 
to do procedures that they may not have done. So all of the healthcare providers uh, that worked in Antarctica uh, reported to me uh, when I had this job. It was a fascinating role, but uh, we leveraged telemedicine to support them because we can't send uh, one doctor who would know everything to be able to handle anything that might come their way. So really an extraordinary uh, capability and things are advancing so quickly now, especially in the aftermath of the, this horrible pandemic. One of the best places, as you know, to get sick is to go to a hospital. So can we deliver high quality care diagnostics in the home and only come into the hospital when we really, really need to? So that's what we're working on right now. And I'm also very engaged right now in undersea exploration. Uh, there are a number of um, enterprises scanning our oceans. We know more about the surface of Mercury and, uh, and Venus than we do our our ocean floors. And so you know, that's changing very rapidly. And uh, by use of submersibles and AUVs and other kinds of vehicles, we're you know, untangling many of the mysteries of our, our ocean. I just returned actually uh, about two months ago from the Titanic. Uh, I dove in a, a submersible called Titan uh, to 6,000, I'm sorry, no, 3,800 meters um, to uh, the bottom of the ocean. And this is actually a ratfish on the upper left here and some of the, the relics that we saw. But it's a place that's teeming of life. There's starfish and other sorts of extraordinary forms of life, uh, but also relics from, from the wreck. Um, and finally, in closing, uh, what am I doing right now? Well, I'm, I'm founder and CEO and CTO of a company called Fluidity that's based on my intellectual property. Um, and it's, it's essentially designed to make movement through three-dimensional space, whether it's flying a drone, an electric vertical takeoff and land goal, or even a surgical bot, much, much more intuitive. And so uh, that in a nutshell is uh, what I wanted to, uh, uh, to cover here this morning. And I think it's probably a good time to take some, uh, some questions that uh, uh, the group might have, but thank you so much for for inviting me to this wonderful event, and I, I look forward to uh, to taking any questions you might have. That was an incredibly enlightening presentation, sir. Thank you so much. Our audience really admires you and have been really excited all this time. I see several questions in the chat box. Um, probably we could get to them now. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Shweta Shetty asks, astronauts usually talk of the profound change they undergo spiritually and psychologically after visiting space, a feeling of cosmic insignificance. How have you changed since? That's a wonderful uh, question. And yes, it, it's a profound life-changing experience that affects everyone slightly differently. But I would say at a minimum, uh, every astronaut comes back uh, from space an environmentalist. You see the fragility of our planet uh, as I described it, the confluence of, uh, of nature and humanity uh, and the thinness of our atmosphere, it's, it's just, it's paper thin, the, this, uh, this layer between us and, and the blackness of space. And, uh, and so, yes, there's a, a peace, a calm, uh, a profound gratitude that you have. For some, it's even a, a, a religious experience. Um, one of our, my colleagues from the Apollo program had sort of a religious epiphany even. Uh, it didn't happen that way for me, but uh, um, certainly um, was a life-changing, wonderful experience. And I hope many more people get this opportunity. Uh, I, I think it's really exciting to think that maybe even some of our political leaders would have an opportunity to fly. Can you imagine if, if warring factions were to be able to fly over their homeland and realize their relative insignificance and uh, I think the concept of war would just uh, evaporate. Thank you, sir. That seems incredible. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Shweta. Uh, next, we have a question from Sahil. He asks, why had there been no manned expeditions to the moon since 1972? That's a, a great question. Uh, and uh, yes, it's been since 1972. Um, the, the program in the aftermath of the Apollo program has focused on exploiting low Earth orbit, um, building space stations, and, and of course, using the space shuttle as we did for many years on the, the American program side. But uh, we're very much engaged in preparing to go back to the moon. 
we have the technologies, uh, much more efficient uh, methods to get re repeatedly to space using SpaceX rockets and others. And uh, so I think within the next uh, you know, handful of years, you'll see uh, not just landings and uh, you know, quick visits to the moon, but actually the assembly of habitats there on the moon, similar to what we have at the South Pole of our own planet, the South Pole Station, we'll have a lunar outpost on the South Pole of the moon. And the reason we'll do that there is because in the craters of the South Pole, there actually is a great deal of water ice, which we can use not only to, to melt and drink, uh, to, to grow plant life, but also to uh, break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen, of course, we could use for, for breathing and the hydrogen uh, potentially for, for fuel. So uh, I, I think you're going to see some really exciting things happening on the moon very shortly. Thank you, sir. That's great to know. I hope that answers your question, Sahil. Uh, next, we have a question from Divi. She asks, why do astronauts sometimes wear white suit and sometimes an orange suit? Oh, great question, Divi. So um, the, the orange, we call them launch and entry suits, are that color because if we were to have to bail out of our space shuttle uh, on launch, it would happen over the North Atlantic Ocean and special search and rescue crews would have to come get us. And it's very difficult to see uh, many colors in contrast in the water, but orange stands out very readily. So that's, that's the reason our launch and entry suits were that color. When we go out on a spacewalk, we have very white uh, suits because that's the, the color that um, is least likely to absorb heat. Um, so it, we see extraordinary temperature swings as we go around the earth. In one orbit, which takes 90 minutes, um, we can see temperatures uh, very, very far below uh, zero. And then um, when we're in direct sunlight, several hundred degrees above zero. Um, and so in order to, for, to control the, the temperature inside of our suit, so the spacewalking suits are white. Thank you so much, sir. That sounds really interesting. I hope that answers your question. Um, next, we have a question from Sridhara. Um, she asks, can physicists become astronauts? And if they can, what are the ways to become an astronaut? Oh, absolutely. We have many physicists who have become astronauts and, and uh, it's a fantastic preparation for being in space. And in fact, uh, we're going to need them on the moon. Um, you know, quite honestly, I think one of the best uh, you know, places to do radio astronomy and astrophysics will be on the far side of the moon um, because of the uh, radio silence that will be available there to be able to look out, you know, essentially to the beginnings of time uh, from that platform and to understand uh, the evolution of our, not only our solar system, but our universe. So there are many, uh, many physicists who have become astronauts. Um, I would point out, however, that when you become an astronaut, you also become a generalist. So as a physician, I learned a great deal about astrophysics and oceanography and meteorology and planetary science and combustion physics and, and uh, uh, metallurgy and, and chemistry, because those are the the language of the science that we do in, in space. So we become generalists. We're doing science, not as principal investigators for ourselves, but to do science for others back on earth. So that's, that's really kind of the, uh, uh, the mindset that you have to think about. But uh, absolutely, it would be a great uh, preparation. As you know, ISRO is a, uh, a wonderful organization. They have a very successful program. They've, they've launched probes to uh, the moon and, and Mars. Um, I believe they have uh, astronauts in, in training as well. Um, and so I, I imagine in the not too distant future, we'll see Indian astronauts in Earth orbit to begin with, and, and then uh, perhaps joining um, interna in that international collaboration on the moon or even Mars. Thank you, sir. That sounds like an exciting range of possibilities. I hope that answers your question. Um, Next, we have a question from Pani Bhushan. He asks, um, you have carried out so many amazing and incredible feats. Is there any adventure that eludes you? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, 
again, I get back to having a sense of wonder or a relentless sense of curiosity. Um, there's so many things that, uh, you know, are, are still beckoning me. I, I would say probably the, the strongest draw right now is, is understanding and protecting our oceans. They're very, very fragile. They're threatened right now. It's not just with plastic waste, but our coral, uh, you know, and, and sea life is, is very threatened because of ocean warming and, and pollution. Um, so it's an area of, of great focus for me um, in importance, I think, for our planet, uh, climate change as well. Um, but I think all of us are explorers. Every time that we leave our home and go to some place we've never been before, we have things that we can learn. So even if it's a place that's been visited millions of times before, if it's the, if it's the first time that you've been there, you're an explorer and, uh, you know, be curious, uh, ask questions, meet people, um, make the most of those experiences. But uh, yes, there, there are many places on the planet that I've yet to be. I've, I've traveled to all seven continents, but there's still many places in between, including your, um, your uh, you know, state in India. Um, I've not been there, so hopefully I'll get a chance to visit one day. Thank you, sir. That seems like an interesting take on the topic. Um, next, we have a question from Devendra Agarwal. He asks, what is the optimal height for an astronaut? And as you said, you were too tall, Joseph. Uh, uh, well, uh, it's a great question. And it sort of depended on what vehicle you were flying on. So we had uh, some astronauts who were, um, I believe, 6'5". So that would be, I don't know, 194 or 195 uh, centimeters, something along that range. Um, and that was fine for the space shuttle. I, I'm, I was about, uh, I shouldn't. I forget how many in, in, in meters, but uh, uh, 185 to 187 centimeters, something like that. Um, so that, that was fine for the space shuttle. Um, however, for the, the Soyuz capsule, it was much more constraining. That's been redesigned and made it possible for taller astronauts to fly. And I believe now with the, the SpaceX Dragon and the uh, uh, other vehicles that are being uh, built, astronauts can be much taller. Uh, and also we can accommodate astronauts who are shorter as well. So I don't think that there should be any, any constraint for you. Thank you so much, sir. That sounds fantastic. Um, next, we have a question from uh, Ed Sadarka. Uh, the question is, was it possible to set up a civilization on Mars 3.5 billion years ago when it had similar conditions as present day Chile? Well, interesting. Uh, so civilization, no, uh, you know, the, um, the, uh, um, it, it probably had uh, free flowing water uh, and a, a bit thicker atmosphere uh, than it has now. Uh, it's a very, very uh, thin atmosphere, about one one hundredth of, of Earth's atmosphere. And of course, one third the gravity uh, you're pulling down to the planet. So, um, with spacesuits and such, it, it would have been able, you know, we would have been able to uh, sustain ourselves there on an earlier Mars, uh, but it still would have been a very inhospitable place. One of the things that we do worry about when we do send human explorers there is that there's no magnetic field really to speak of. It's very, very weak. And what that means is that there's a higher risk of radiation induced cancer. So when we do send astronauts to Mars, they'll likely have to live underground in shielded environments and they'll, they'll come up periodically to do exploration and, and so on. But uh, most of their time they'll spend underground because of the, uh, uh, the radiation that exists there. It's galactic cosmic radiation. Um, and then we call them coronal mass ejections or CMEs from the sun. And so without protection, um, you can, even um, be susceptible to acute radiation poisoning and, and die. So very, very serious uh, consideration when we start to think about building habitats there on Mars. Thank you, sir. That sounds very intriguing. Um, unfortunately, since we are uh, running short on time, we might have to wind this up with one final question. Um, sure. Gunjan Dhanuka asks, many people dream of being an astronaut when they are in their childhood, but slowly give up as they grow up. What made you stick to it? And what would you say to all of us who dreamt once 
but feel that it isn't possible anymore as they grow up. I would say hold on to your dreams with all of your your might, and then relentlessly pursue them. And the way that um, I would uh, um, share the story uh, is to reflect back on the time that I was uh, in a program called the Boy Scouts, and I, I know that there are boys. There's a Boy Scout program in India, and I'd imagine a Girl Scout program as well. Um, but in America, we have uh, the highest rank, which is called Eagle Scout. And it's a very difficult thing to get. It takes a couple of years at a minimum. And many people get very discouraged because there's so many things that you have to do, different awards that you have to win and projects that you have to do. And, uh, and many people quit. So only 1% actually make it all the way to the, the finish line to get this award. And what I learned as a boy is if I just focused on the next step in the pathway to getting to where I wanted to go, I could reward myself, I could see progress, and it was a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. And so I could, I, could, um, I could reward myself along the way. And, um, and I've used that same sort of reinforcing principle all through my life, you know, becoming a physician, um, becoming an astronaut, getting to the top of Mount Everest, uh, growing a company as I'm doing now. Um, and so my advice to you is to have those big dreams, but then also to chart your pathway to getting there. What are the things that you can do along your path to getting to your ultimate goal? You know, make, make real plans to get to that next step and the next step and the next step. And you'll find very quickly um, that you're making great progress and um, each success opens up new doors that you, you wouldn't imagine. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not easy getting to your loftiest goals, but it is possible and uh, I'm living proof of it. That is definitely a very inspiring answer. Thank you so much for joining Thank us today. You. And it was a wonderful time for all of us here. I'm sure our audience found a lot of value in this talk today. And it has definitely motivated many innovators to change their, to chase their dreams relentlessly the way you have been doing. Thank you so much. It's Thank been my so honor. We would like to remind you um, of the meet with the organizers after this. I think we have mailed the link to you. Okay. I'll, I'll look for that link and I'll rejoin you shortly. Thank you so much. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, we would like to remind our audience that we have two lectures upcoming tomorrow. Um, we have Christopher Weaver, who has worked on um, designing several games. And uh, we also have a joint lecture by Matthew Cunningham and Dionisio Tapoya, who have um, worked on the sets of several popular films. Uh, the descriptions of the same can be found at the link that has been posted in the chat box. Uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.